Hello and uh, welcome to today's webinar OS, from OSG. Um, I'm Leighton Quinton, Director of Product Marketing at OSG. And today's webinar topic is COVID-19 Drivers of Consumer Behavioural Change. So this is useful for anyone trying to understand in more detail how consumer behaviour has changed since COVID-19 and summarises some of our recent syndicated research work. The webinar itself lasts about 35 minutes and will be followed by your chance to ask any questions. Um, protocols for the webinar, um, we'll have the Q&A at the end of the webinar, but you can send me your questions at any time during the webinar just using the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom um, of, of the bar, of the Zoom bar there. You should see a uh, little Q&A and two speech bubbles. Um, copies of webinar materials and the ability to follow up in more detail be available to all after the webinar on request um, and also as you sign off today you'll see a very short survey just asking how useful the webinar was for you and, and what you'd like to see in in future OSG webinars so that would be uh, really useful to us if you could if you could complete that. Um, so without further ado I'll, I'll introduce today's uh, speakers. Um, so um, first of all um, uh, we have Vibhav, Vibhav Sharma, who is an, M an MBA graduate with more than 12 years of experience in market research with analytics firms such as Kantar, Gempact and Absolute Data before he joined us at OSG. Um, and at OSG helps clients across verticals from CPG, retail banking, medical devices, pharma, automotive uh, and many others driving with innovation um, pricing and, and product launches, so supporting our clients in those areas, um, as well as customer segmentation and, and targeting. Um, also with Vibhav, we have Jeff, Jeff Weaver, who is our Vice President of Client Engagement at OSG uh, and holds a, a Bachelor of Finance from the University of Missouri, um, as well as a dual master's degree from Mercy University in Business Administration and Accountancy. So Jeff's focus at OSG is on understanding the customer journey and diving deep into understanding what really matters to consumers at critical touch points along the decision making process. Um, so I'll now uh, hand you over to Jeff uh, to tell us a little bit more about this this research. Over to you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Leighton. Um, thanks, everybody that did tune in today. So obviously, as you said, I'm Jeff. I'm, I'm based uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm excited to be able to share some stuff with you guys today. So, you know, before we, you know, get straight into the study and its findings, you know, I want to, to reiterate, reiterate, you know, who OSG is and what we do. You know, everything we do is centered around the consumer. Uh, we use our technologies and our you know, proprietary methodologies, you know, to get to the heart of really what matters uh, to customers and understand, you know, why they make the decisions that they do. Uh, and because we understand you know, what matters to the individual, uh, we're able to do segmentation better, pricing better, messaging better, um, and innovation more uh, efficiently. So, you know, ultimately what OSG allows you to do is intervene at critical points in that customer journey to predict future behavior and then either remove friction or provide the appropriate influence to steer behavior in the desired direction. You know, so why is this research important? Um, you know, you know, as much as we all might be getting COVID fatigue, there is uh, no doubt that it's shaken up both the personal and business landscape. Um, In-home consumption has skyrocketed um, in some categories, while out-of-home uh, has come to a near standstill in others. So this has led to a lot of confusion uh, with organizations because how they know and understand their customers has totally changed and they need to understand the shift. You know, however, we must take it, you know, one step further, not just understand that the shift is happening, but really getting to the heart of, you know, the underlying motivations behind these behavioral changes. Bravo. Yep. Sorry. Um, so, okay. So let's, let's, uh, you know, uh, start talking about the study itself. Uh, before we actually get into the findings uh, of the study, just wanted to set a little background about the study. Um, so we approximately talked to around uh, 5,300 respondents across uh, EU3, which is UK, France, and Germany, um, LATAM, which is Brazil and Mexico, and US. 
Um, so it was a large sample study that we did. Um, and uh, for, I mean, it would take us quite a bit of time to actually go through, uh, you know, the differences across uh, these countries that we, you know, went ahead and did this indicated research in. So for this particular webinar, we're focusing on one of the country results, uh, which is Germany. And, uh, and we're looking at how and what can brands do to motivate uh, consumers, uh, you know, in terms of their purchase decision making. Uh, before we actually get into data and you know some of the findings, uh, just wanted to kind of point out uh, about our methodology, our core IP, which is called as ASMAP. Uh, it's a method which is uh, which was developed at Stanford University. Uh, we've done more than fifteen hundred engagements. Uh, it has been verified uh, mul across multiple industries. You know, in last uh, a little over a decade that we've been in business. Uh, so ASMAP is, is a method which allows us to very accurately measure uh, what matters to consumers, right? So whether we talk about uh, motivations, whether we talk about the needs, expectations, uh, we could contextualize uh, whatever the objectives are. Um, and the reason why we say that ASMAP can accurately measure this is uh, it's not a back box. So if you, if you ever Google ASMAP, uh, you'll, you'll find a research paper, published research paper, which gives you all the all the details uh, about it uh, and its comparison. The flexibility that ASMAP provides us is, uh, you know, is, is very useful. It's useful because uh, we can test way more attributes than, you know, what a typical other methods in this space would do. Um, it's, uh, it's the modeling happens. I wouldn't want to get into too technical, but the modeling happens at a very individual level, which basically means that uh, every respondent, um, we literally know what matters to them, right? Given that, uh, it helps us to kind of uh, segment the market or segment consumers based on needs, motivations, whatever it is, um, you know, in a far much more, you know, distinctive manner and you, you know, land up with far much more clearer and distinctive segments, which are easy to target. Um, so that's about ASMAP. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, so here's, you know, kind of an overview of uh, you know, categories of attributes that were chosen for the study. You know, how much do consumers trust brands? And how important is that trust? You know, safety. Should safety be considered a, more of a priority now under this new environment? Uh, there's definitely been a disruption in channel. You know, how important is availability and how detrimental is, uh, you know, stocking out? You know, what are consumers seeking now in products? You know, and how sensitive are they? Uh, to price in this, uh, in this kind of new normal. And then what's hitting the eyes and the ears of the consumer and what is actually motivating them? And Bob, do you want to talk any more about kind of the breadth of attributes uh, that were used? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, these, uh, we, we adopted a very top-down approach uh, while deciding on these attributes. So, you know, the six categories that you look at are very broad categories that we started off with. Uh, eventually, when you dig deeper under each of these categories, there are different aspects that you can, uh, that can drive uh, customers' preferences, their behavior. Uh, so we eventually landed up with uh, 34 different attributes uh, that were tested in this particular scenario work that we did. Uh, we're not gonna go through all of those 34 because uh, it just doesn't make sense, but we quickly wanted to touch upon these four, sorry, six broad categories, um, you know, which, which uh, largely formulate the 34 different uh, motivations and uh, that we tested out in this particular study. Uh, moving on, uh, just wanted to kind of show uh, what an ASMAP results looks like. Uh, I don't want to get into the technicality, but in a very simplistic way, what ASMAP allows us to do is create a hierarchy of different needs or motivations. Um, uh, and, and the numbers that you see there are, uh, are relative importance. So what that basically means is something which is at 140, uh, is is forty percent more important than let's say an attribute which is at hundred, right? So just wanted to quickly highlight that aspect in terms of um, you know we understanding the data uh, and the methodology and the outputs uh, that come out of it. As I said earlier, um, you know given one of the benefits of ASMA, which is uh, the modeling and the estimation happens at a very individual level, so we know what is important to every individual, every respondent. It's not an aggregated method 
uh, wherein you know a lot of these insights are um, you know estimated at an aggregate level or modeled at an aggregate level. Um, given that uh, estimation happens at an individual level, uh, what it allows us to do is create far much more distinct segments and classifications and identify these cohorts, um, which which behave very similarly, which are homogeneous within. Right, so if, what you see on your screen is uh, when you look at the overall sample for Germany, uh, it basically clearly identified to us, uh, you know, who are the ones who are health focused, who are the ones who are safety concerned, any benefit which uh, talk about safety, you know, any benefit which talk about uh, products uh, and their, uh, you know, uh, the, the health focused nature of those products, right? Um, and, and what is the last group and what is important to them. So you could clearly see the distinction uh, between each of these groups is very clear in terms of what is important and by how much. And uh, those differences are basically started out here. Jeff? Yep. Um, so the three groups or segments identified here, you know, we have, you know, health. This group has uh, clearly been emerging over the last several years and it's only going to, you know, continue to grow. Um, you know, you have the safety concern. COVID has brought, uh, you know, a lot more attention to this group. You know, people are prioritizing the safety of themselves and their families. You know, they want to have trust with who and where the products they are buying come from. And then you have the undeterred. You know, as of now, they they haven't budged. So let's you know dive into each of these a little more. Um, you know, you have the health group. You know, as stated, you know above this group, you know really has been making waves uh, for a while now. Um, this is the group that will read the labels. Uh, they will choose food and beverage products that align with their healthy lifestyle. You know, they want to know what's in the products they consume. They put a lot of trust in certifications, you know, like organic labeling, labeling or similar. Uh, this group's mostly millennials and Gen Z, so needless to say, they will have a major impact on the uh, F&B marketplace for a very long time, you know, and what's interesting about these guys is during the, this pandemic, their food and beverage purchases have actually gone up, all while, you know, a significant, significant decrease uh, with trips to brick and mortar, so that just puts even more emphasis on you know, those touch points, when they do make purchases, they're going up, less trips, those become much more critical and really understanding at those touch points, what is motivating those decisions. Sure. So uh, safety concern, uh, you know, if you were to literally visualize these people, these are, you know, young adults, uh, you know, very much, uh, you, know, with, you know, with jobs, very much like people like us that you see on your screen. Um, and these are the people who are these are these are people who are worried about uh, safety aspects. How do how do they keep their families safe? Um, and they they're driven largely, you know, uh, largely with those aspects, right? So when we talk about those specific aspects uh, related to food and beverage, um, you know, they it's not just related to food and beverage. I mean, this could be applicable to any any consumer packaged good indu uh, industry. Um, you know, they're more focused on, uh, or they're more driven by sanitized packaging. How does brand ensure that the products which are available on the shelf are, are sanitized and, you know, they, there is no risk to them uh, while they go ahead and shop those. Um, you know, what guidelines, I mean, these, these people would follow guidelines and, you know, uh, will abide by those uh, rules set by, you know, either state or federal uh, authorities or any public health authorities. Um, awareness of these protocols is something which is, uh, is, is important to them. Uh, they look for these information they seek out. Uh, as I said, you know, these are young adults, married, uh, may, maybe with kids. Um, again, very similar to health focused. Uh, since they're concerned about their safety, they have decreased their frequency. Um, but it, um, they've, they've kind of kind of substituted that with buying more uh, in, in every time they kind of visit uh, the stores. So um, again, so this is decrease in frequency shopping trip and, you know, as Jeff said, uh, less number of touch points uh, to influence them. Um, and which basically means that the brands have to be more aligned to their needs and to their motivations. You know, then we got the uh, undeterred. I mean, this group hasn't really, you know, hasn't budged under the new normal. Uh, they're mostly made up of, you know, 48 plus um, and, you know, we're motivated by the, motivated by the traditional means of, you know, brand trust, promotion, um, and pricing. So, 
you know, by Bob, I know you want to talk about how you can compare that kind of to our last study. Sure. Yeah, so the, the two points that I would want to bring up here, which is, um, you know, I'm not sure how many of uh, you who are attending this webinar attended the webinar that we did last month, uh, which was more on, um, you know, ensuring compliance with the uh, COVID-19 guidelines, which are set by state or federal government. Uh, you know, how do we motivate uh, people to kind of follow those particular guidelines for everyone's safety? Uh, while we did that particular research, uh, we identified a, a segment there which we called it uh, skeptics. And skeptics were those people who didn't really care about uh, what these guidelines are, no matter how much data you show them. Uh, they, they basically went about doing what they usually do, right? So um, it's, it's more like you know, sm telling a smoker that smoking is bad for him, but you know, he continues, he or she continues. So, these this group is is very similar to that you know and this is where uh, in fact even demographically if you look at the age group it's very similar to skeptics uh, that we did there and uh, they are the ones who you know not changed their behavior in terms of uh, you know purchase habits or what are, where, where, where they are spending um, so their um, uh, you know requirements remain still the same which actually brings me to my second point, which is, you know, very recently I read this article by McKinsey and uh, Yale Insights team, uh, which talked about how COVID has led to a lot of change and, you know, marketers need to be oppressed with the consumer journey and the touch points and how they have changed, uh, which is all true and important. Uh, but, you know, the, the word change and everything changed stuck to my head while, while I was reading that article. And, uh, you know, looking at this group, this is one of those groups which has not changed, right? So it's, it's not, um, you know, it, there's nothing to, you know, think that everything would have changed. That's, that's, that's not the case uh, as, per, as per what we found out. Okay, so uh, let's get a little deeper into, into the findings and, you know, and into the data that we have. Uh, before I actually jump into what this uh, chart is and what sort of inferences, uh, you know, and what sort of strategies it helps our, uh, you know, it helps any F&B uh, brand to kind of uh, adopt. Um, wanted to explain what this particular chart is. So, you know, as I said, we tested out 34 different attributes. Um, you know, there are important attributes. There are uh, attributes which are relatively lesser important than the others. Um, so all of those were basically put into this particular four buckets, right? So you have uh, from low to high importance, and these are, uh, you know, x-axis is more uh, where you have, uh, you know, these particular motivations or these needs, are they, or these attributes, are they particularly currently addressed in the market or not? Uh, when you look at this particular bit, uh, what this helps you to understand is you have the green quadrant, which is the top right quadrant, uh, those are basically a white space opportunity. Those are the ones which are important um, to consumers, but currently not addressed or not met in the market, right? So any brand which is focusing on delivering those uh, aspects uh, are basically kind of, uh, would have a very high impact in terms of motivating consumers uh, towards their brand. Uh, the, the quadrant on the left is more, uh, you know, hygiene needs, they are important. Uh, you would not get any uh, additional preference or, uh, you know, from consumer if you address those things, but you do, there is a risk of you getting penalized if, uh, you know, in terms of consumer preferences, if, if you're not addressing those aspects, right? So given that, uh, let's just look at the data a little more closely. Uh, what you have in the green quadrant is uh, things like, you know, how do you ensure sanitized product packaging, right? So very recently, you know, saw this thing, which was not done by any manufacturer, but a retailer uh, where they had, and this was in the Middle East, uh, where they had every product on the shelf was wrapped in a plastic with a simple uh, note uh, and, a, and a board at the, at, the, at the entrance, which clearly said that, you know, the products inside those wraps have been sanitized and not touched by human. Um, you know, and you were supposed to discard the packaging, right? So this throws in ideas in terms of, you know, how can we as a brand ensure, uh, you know, and this was a more modern retail uh, trade, right? So not every uh, retail channel or brick or mortar channel would 
address these uh, or uh, you know safety concerns uh, in the way the bigger chains might be able to. So how how can a brand help address those uh, you know uh, motivations or those those requirements from customers? Uh, you have and again this aligns very nicely from I mean this is largely coming from the safety concern. Uh, you have things like uh, products made out of organic ingredients. Again, um, something which is being largely driven by the health focus group. Um, you know, they are the ones who are looking for non-GMO, organic. Uh, you know, st- uh, products with no preservatives. You know, all of those uh, healthy stuff. And then the third group is more. You know, as as Jeff said, right. So undeterred is more aligned to. You know. Uh, Brand related uh, require uh, you know brand trust related uh, needs. Uh, you have other promotional offers uh, which drive their behavior, and of course you know channel related uh, aspects as well. So, in a nutshell, uh, to summarize, uh, you know this whole particular uh, study. Um, so we we have three different distinct segments in terms of you know how they are motivated. Um, while while they make a purchase decision, um, again, health focus is, has a stronger emphasis on you know the healthy aspects, which is organic, non-GMO. So any brand which has organic products in the market, you know, would need to communicate that well. Um, you know, if if not, uh, and if there is an opportunity to bring in organic or non-GMO, those sort of labeling, healthy labeling aspect of things, uh, new products, uh, you know, those are the areas where. Uh, brands could really uh, focus on health focus, and as Jeff said, right. So, uh, needless to say, these are you know young people. Uh, these are Gen Z, so they're gonna stay there. And if if health is uh, of a very high focus to them, it's it's pr- probably gonna remain for a decent amount of time. That uh, is worth the investment. Safety concern. Uh, again, um, this is something which uh, brands uh, should you know probably think about. How can we ensure that the whole shopping experience or buying experience uh, that they have, you know, is safe, right? Retailers can do up to a certain aspect, but not all retailers might be able to address those issues. So this is where brands need to see and come up with maybe new innovative ideas how how they could address this. Uh, Undeterred uh, is is basically the segment which, uh, you know, as I said, you know, um, not everything has changed. And this is that particular segment which has not changed. So, you know, uh, we basically continue to deliver on their aspects, which is, you know, creating more brand salience, uh, you know, ensuring brand trust, uh, you know, giving them, um, of course, giving them those offers and promotions, which basically drive their purchase, um, as well as, you know, addressing any channel related issues, uh, which, which may exist in the market, right? So, uh, again, so those, those are, uh, you know, our three segments and what is what drives their behavior and how can brand f and brands really utilize um, this thing to target them far much more effectively. I think uh, that's that's all that we had uh, from from this particular study. Any uh, we're open to questions. Okay, thank, thank you Vipav, thank you Jeff. Um, there are a few questions coming in as 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 uh, as I'm speaking. So, um, first one that came in a little earlier: um, Has this research been done in other geographical markets? Uh, and if so, what kind of differences could could we expect to see? So, um, as I said, you know, we've done this in LATAM. We've done this in three different countries in Europe. Um, you know, so when we say UK, Germany, France, these three countries are. I mean, maybe UK and Germany are, are, you know, very different from each other. Definitely Mexico and Brazil are different. So uh, the kind of segments and the kind of motivations that came out are different. Uh, you, we got certain, you know, financially focused or, you know, uh, financially concerned segment as well in LATAM. Um, and the sizes of these segment in terms of health focused or security concern or safety concern are uh, different. So those are certain, um, you know, uh, certain differences which have come out across different markets. Uh, again, you know, a lot depends upon, you know, that country's economic situation as well. Um, so all of those aspects are something which uh, we've been able to uncover. Uh, it's not one size fits all. So, but there are differences. There are a lot of things which are common, like a safety concern group is something that you would see almost everywhere. 
um, you know, but but there are other groups uh, where you know, let's say in in LATAM you have uh, health focus, which are slight. Uh, I mean, I won't say significantly, but definitely smaller than the groups that we found in Europe. So yes, there are differences. Okay, um, another question. Um, I have a boutique chain, a boutique chain of soaps and a five stores. Could this method could this method help me with my business? Can it show what my customer might want right now and help me advertise better? Um, I'm sorry, uh, you said uh, boutique of soaps. Sorry, it was, was I, that? Yes, I have a boutique chain of soaps and have five stores. Can okay. this method help me with my business, uh, with advertising and understanding my customer? Yes, it can. And yes, it will. Because uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, irrespective of the category, ASMAP could help you understand what matters to them. Uh, and, you know, how, what are those needs or expectations based on which they actually make their brand choice, right? Um, so given that, um, you know, uh, given that you you could utilize, uh, you know, depending on what is important to them, what resonates with them for better communication, uh, better offerings. Um, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, uh, you know, any sort of product innovations could be brought in, but, you know, maybe at a future stage, uh, you know, it could drive any of those decisions. Again, you know, um, it, it all depends upon where, uh, what objective, uh, you know, uh, apart, I mean, communications, yes. I mean, you could use those needs uh, to kind of uh, formulate a communication strategy in terms of how you're going to reach out to them and with what message. Uh, that optimization work can definitely be done. But yeah, uh, at an overall level, you might need to, I mean, we may need to kind of look at how and what are the larger objectives for those. Okay, thank you, Vipa. It's kind of related, this question, actually, but um, I'll throw this one at Jeff. So, um, you know, we talked about the syndicated research and Vipav there was talking about how the methodology can be used in other ways. But, you know, um, is it possible that OSG can complete similar research to this, but, you know, in other categories and geographies? So what we've seen, you know, but as well as what we've done, is it easy to, to replicate that elsewhere? Yeah, so absolutely. So the short answer is yes. Um, you know, some of the attributes will likely be the same. Um, of course, the percentages in each market, um, you know, will be different and unique uh, to yours. Uh, and you may already even have some work that you're doing around this that will accompany it, accompany it uh, you know, very well to, you know, kind of get more insights into this new normal. And in fact, if, Clayton, if you don't mind throwing my email address up there in the chat, if anybody wants to, you know, talk more specific about, you know, maybe their country or their region, um, we'd be happy to, to dive into that a little bit and see what that looks like. That's great, Jeff. Thank you. Um, okay, this is, this is a great question. Um, so um, being asked, um, how, does, how does our system work for, for new product development? Um, so, you know, in, in terms of understanding um, uh, something like, say, sports were. Okay, so uh, the way uh, the way this works is largely uh, by understanding what those and what those needs, important needs are, and uh, what those unmet needs are. Now, any company or any category which is uh, addressing or any brand which is trying to address these unmet needs by let's say product introduction um, basically has a higher chance because you know you are trying to meet an unmet need in the market right so that's that's where this methodology is utilized very heavily and you know it's not just on the consumer side uh, this methodology is utilized by even on the b2b side uh, while products are getting designed to really get and understand, you know, what are those needs and where do you really need to put in your money while you're developing this new product? Uh, does it even address the needs which are, you know, unmet and are important to them? Or are, are you addressing needs which are maybe relatively lesser important? Uh, so your return on investment on that particular product would, would come out to be lower. 
Okay, I've just got um, one final Hi. question here that's, that's come in. Um, so it, it's kind of a, a, an example, I think, like a, a fictional example. So um, just a view, really, I think. So um, imagine the scenario, new chocolate was introduced with more ingredients and a slightly higher price. Um, and after this successful market launch, the, the tasty chocolate was produced with less fruit. Okay, so is that a strategy or, or a reason to lose trust in the brand? How, how would you kind of define that vibe have in terms of? Um, I mean, I, I am, um, I mean, I, I actually, my brain has a lot more cross questioning on, on that whole example, but uh, I'll, I'll try to, you know, answer that um, in, in a very uh, simple way. So, um, the new chocolate that you said, uh, which was introduced with more ingredients, uh, with a little higher price, uh, uh, you know, and after successful introduction, uh, tasty chocolate was produced with lesser fruit. Um, it's, it, it's, I mean, with with lesser fruits uh, was actually, I mean, so what I'm what I'm assuming your question here is that. The plan was to kind of come up with a uh, lot more ingredients at a higher price, but you know when when it got to uh, you know actual product being launched, it was not uh, you know uh, you know at the same level, right? So uh, is that a strategy or you know uh, what I would say is uh, it could work in very different ways, right? So when you create this product, uh, the benefit of a chocolate. Uh, which consumers have is is what we really need to understand, right? So, am I am I having a chocolate? I mean, am I am I having a dark chocolate because I'm more health concerned, right? And I don't want that level of sugar inside me. Uh, am I having these chocolates because I like fruits? So again, depending on what those underlying benefits are, which are important to consumers. If we are addressing those particular benefits, uh, you know, in the product that is being launched, it has a, you know, you could you could use that to, you know, get a higher, uh, you know, you could use that to kind of price it higher as well. Uh, you know, you could you would have a far much more higher success rate with that particular uh, sort of a strategy. I won't say it would be a reason to lose. Okay, thank you. Um... We've still got questions coming in, but I think what we'll do is we'll, we will reply to these questions for sure. Um, so um, we, we will respond to those of you that are, are still submitting questions and, and please do keep those questions coming. You know, um, we're very keen to, and the speakers are very keen to, to have that dialogue. So um, let's do that. Um, uh, when you leave the webinar today, thank you everyone for attending. It would be great if you could uh, just complete that quick survey for us. Um, thanks once again to, to our speakers um, and you can find details of um, all OSG's future uh, webinars on, on the uh, links I've provided in the chat there as well as our contact details um, and of course um, on our website you, as well you'll find details of that. So um, thank you very much everybody for attending today um, and hopefully look forward to welcoming you all to, to the next OSG webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.